Welcome everyone to this month's Financial Security for All Community of Practice webinar. We are a group of extension educators and others who work in the area of personal finance education. And this is our regular monthly webinar. We're excited to have with us today from CFPB, Diane Standhard. She's uh, talking about the CFPB reports on banking access and consumer finances in the South. Diane is Senior Engagement and Policy Fellow with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So as we are listening to Diane today, you will have an opportunity to engage in some, some polls and questions that you have throughout the presentation. If you could put those in the Q&A, the Q&A will be open and available for you and we will be able to capture those and make sure that we circle back around and have time to respond to your questions and comments throughout the webinar. So we're so excited to have Diane with us today. And um, so I'm just going to turn it over to her. Great, thank you so much. It's really fantastic to, to be here and really thankful to present information about the CFPB as well as to hear from you about what you are seeing with your clients what is happening in the towns and places that you live. So really look forward to the questions and discussion afterwards. So I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, my screen. So I think I'll be speaking for about 20 minutes, uh, but again, as Laura said, uh, please put any questions or comments or thoughts into the chat as we go. Um, and of course, we'll look forward to um, talking afterwards. And Laura, please let me know if I come close to uh, to my time as I um, just audibly let me know. I won't be able to see you while I'm presenting. Um, so again, as Laura mentioned, we last summer, the CFPB published two reports on banking and consumer finances in the Southern region of the US. The publication of these reports are part of our ongoing commitment to better understand consumer experiences in rural communities and other areas of emphasis in the, in the, in the country. And so just uh, quickly, uh, my disclaimer that um, this uh, presentation today doesn't represent legal interpretation, guidance, or advice on behalf of the Bureau and any opinions or views uh, that I state are my own and may not represent the Bureau's views. So uh, here are the two reports. Again, they highlight both gaps and identify opportunities to improve financial outcomes for many Southerners. These are the links to where you can uh, access them on, on our website. Um, they cover a broad range of issues like uh, consumer credit profiles, medical debt, mortgage lending, uh, auto lending, uh, credit card origination rates, a, whole, a lot of information. Uh, we're not going to cover all of that today. We're primarily going to focus on high-level points related to um, banking access and mortgage access, um, a little bit about medical debt, and a little bit about updates about what else the CFPB is doing. But the other important thing about both of these reports is they do include state level fact sheets. So um, as part of the discussion afterwards today, if you want uh, access to uh, fact sheets specific to your state, we would be able to get those to you, but they're also available um, at these links here. So to begin with, the first thing we set out to do is to under, really understand what is the southern region of the United States. And so the eight states covered in this report are home to 48 million people. And we know that this region is rich in its diversity with a mix of race, age, incomes across both rural and non-rural communities. So uh, we have a lot more data about demographics in the southern, southern region in the report, but just to highlight a quick few, that 70% um, of the nation's rural black population lives in these eight southern states. It's got a significant immigrant community and a significant over 4.8 million people with limited English proficiency. And, you know, we know many people think of rural communities as older communities, but they are also communities that are home to a significant younger population, where one in five rural Southerners are between the ages of 18 and 34. So this type of analysis was important for both to under help us understand, um, you know, that these differences may affect how people access and what they might need 
um, in terms of accessing their financial services. And also, again, to identify where there may be gaps and opportunities in serving different communities within the Southern region. And one of the unique dynamics of this particular area in the Southern region is that nearly half of the nation's persistent poverty counties are, are in these eight states. And these are counties which have had a poverty rate of 20% or more for at least 30 years. And they are home to 7 million people and are disproportionately rural. So then we talk a little bit about banking access. This is something we heard a lot um, in our engagement in the region and trying to understand what challenges people were experiencing was, you know, simply that ability to access a banking relationship in the first place. Um, so we do find in terms of banking access that this region of the country relative to elsewhere does have a lower number of branches per 10,000 people than nationally. So 3.6 branches per 10,000 people compared to five nationally. Um, you know, then combined with limited branch access is, as many people may know, it's also challenges in accessing high quality broadband in the region. And so one good uh, news uh, in the region over the last few years that the data finds is that the unbanked rate, both across the region as a whole and in specific states, has actually declined in um, over several years. Um, even, but even with this decline, there are still, um, you know, there's still progress to be made. But this decline does indicate that, you know, high unbanked rates in the region doesn't have to remain a permanent feature in the financial landscape. So we do note that Mississippi and Louisiana have the highest unbanked rates in the country. Higher unbanked rates generally are found in rural communities and communities of color. And then we looked at why and found that some of the top barriers to access to a bank account include things like uh, meeting minimum balance requirements, a lack of trust in banks, high bank account fees, and there's even a variation of these uh, reasons among different population groups in the region. So then we move along to credit access. And here in our papers, we focus mostly on mortgage lending. And the reason we focus mostly on mortgage lending to measure credit access is because of the vast amount of data that we have about it through the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. So the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act is, uh, you know, how the uh, financial institutions have been reporting data about their mortgage lending activity for, you know, several decades. Um, and that allows us to identify where there may be gaps um, and or different patterns related to mortgage lending um, uh, more generally. So here we found that across the region that Southern consumers often face more difficulties accessing credit and when they do may face higher interest rates. So for example, while Southern rural consumers apply for mortgages at the same rate as consumers nationwide, they're actually much more likely to have their applications denied. In the rural South, 27% of mortgage applications are denied compared to 11% nationally. And then looking at those persistent poverty counties, the green counties on the maps we just saw, they're nearly four times more likely to have their application denied than consumers nationally. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what might be driving those denials in a little bit. But we do find that when someone is able to access a mortgage loan, uh, that the average interest rate on that loan uh, might be higher than for consumers in other parts of the country. So the other thing we found regionally is that rural borrowers, minority borrowers, and low and moderate income neighborhoods in the Southern region have a lower share of home purchase loans than their share of the population. So for example, even though 23% of the Southern population lives in a rural county, only 14% of home loans in 2021 went to those areas. So 23% of the population, but just 14% of the home loans for rural communities. Over a four year period, only 9% of home purchase loans went to black rural borrowers in the South, even though they represent 24% of the region's rural population. So 24% of population, only 9% of home loans for black rural borrowers. And across the lenders, we also see similar lower rates for uh, low to moderate income neighborhoods in rural areas. So then we looked again a little bit what might be driving these denials. 
And in this paper, we did an initial analysis and found that at least credit scores alone are not explaining these lower levels of lending to different communities. So this is for the region as a whole, but we have this data available by state as well. But here you can see we looked at high credit score borrowers, those that are above 680. Um, and also we could look at what was happening with lower credit score borrowers uh, below 680. And so even among high credit score borrowers, borrowers in rural communities generally are facing higher denial rates than those in non-rural communities, so 10% to 9%. But there are some important differences when you look by race and ethnicity. So here we can see, for example, that a black rural borrower with a credit score above 680, over a four year period, those borrowers experienced a 17% denial rate compared to comparable white rural borrowers with a high credit score experiencing a 9% denial rate. And so we can see similar disparities uh, in non-rural communities and again also for lower credit score borrowers. This is an area of continuing interest for, for the Bureau and we'll welcome feedback in your experiences and what you see maybe contributing to some of these denials. So this is an example of a table that's in the report and is again available by state that just looks at, you know, who is lending to who in the region? So one key theme that um, is happening in the South and is consistent with what's happening nationally is that actually the majority of home loans are made by what is known as non-depository lenders. Um, so this is the column we can see over 400,000 loans in the Southern region were made by non-depository lenders. So this is lenders other than banks and credit unions. That's what that means. So it could be online lenders or independent mortgage brokers. And that's really significant um, in terms of understanding the marketplace. Um, but then we can also see, you know, which borrowers are being reached by small banks or large banks or credit unions. And so you can see, for example, for credit unions, 26% of their loans in the South, that bottom row under the credit union column, 26% of their loans went to minority borrowers. Uh, for small banks, it was 17%, and large banks, 20%. Uh, so that happy to discuss that more uh, later. And then this is just an example of what a state fact sheet looks like. So here, this is just rural Alabama as an example. Uh, again, we can see that the majority of all loans are being made by non-depositories, even in rural Alabama, and we can see the different performance of different lenders uh, to different um, different borrower groups in in the region. So, just a little bit about small business lending in terms of access to credit. We don't have uh, similar data um, in the way that we have for Humda data for mortgages, um, but we were able to uh, look at other. Uh, so, I don't. We can't show those same charts. Uh, for small business lending in the same we do for mortgage lending. But we do hear from the region around challenges and access to credit for minority and small owned businesses and those that are owned by women. And we can see in the data uh, generally that they're a significant part of the econo economy uh, in the region where nearly one third of small businesses in the southern region are minority owned and 38 percent are owned by women. There may be an indication that not all businesses are getting access to the capital they need. And finally, just looking at the consumer finances side, just a little bit about medical debt collections. Um, so in our report, we looked at over a two year period from March 2020 to April 2022 and found that uh, in the rural South, 28 percent of consumers had some type of medical debt collection on their credit report over the two year period. So the rural South was 28 percent of consumers, but nationally, it was 17%, so 28% to 17%. And we know that rural Southerners uh, with medical collections are much, and with consumers generally, are more likely to be delinquent on other types of debt like mortgages or auto loans. And here, this again, of a chart, you can just see how different states uh, do uh, in terms of percentage of consumers affected by medical debt collections on their reports. So here we see South Carolina with 34%, of rural consumers having a medical debt collection on their report um, at some point during that period. The good news is that changes are coming. Um, so one um, development that has already taken um, into a, 
effect is that in April of 2023, the three major credit reporting bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, all implemented voluntary changes to some, you know, changes to how medical debt is showing up on people's credit reports. So they removed medical debt collections that were less than $500, removed ones that were paid by any source, and also will not report medical debts that are less than a year old. So those changes have already taken taken uh, place. Um, and here you can see just that throughout the South, there'll be a larger, uh, larger than um, national share of consumers who will be benefiting from these removals. Um, the We know that there'll be so many consumers benefiting from these removals because there's just simply so much medical debt in the South. And so we know there's more work to be done. And so one of the things that the Bureau is continuing to do is ensure that medical debt, um, uh, to address medical debt on people's credit reports is we actually recently announced a proposal to actually remove all medical debt from consumers' credit reports. Um, and we are seeking, um, you know, looking forward to public feedback on that proposal and we can talk about that more in a minute. So hopefully uh, changes, uh, changes already underway related to medical debt in the Southern region. And then just a quick note about student loan debt. This was uh, data um, as of February, 2020. So this was you know, prior to the uh, payment pause during the, the, the uh, pandemic. So this was just to give a snapshot of like, how might people be doing once returned over payment started as it has. So here we can just see that 15% of rural Southerners had an open student loan uh, with over $18,000 uh, balance. 9% of borrowers were delinquent at that time and 14% were in default. Both of these numbers are higher in non-rural areas and nationally. And then 19, what's, we can also see another gap of 19% of rural Southerners were enrolled in income-driven repayment plans at that time versus 21% nationally. And I think um, what's being dropped into the chat are a few resources related to student loan debt since uh, since the published publication of this report, you know, return to repayment has started. So in the chat, we're including um, a recent report that the CFPB has done related to the challenges people are experiencing um, as that repayment has started. And then also a blog that is uh, pretty uh, accessible for helping people understand what their options may be in this moment, both for enrolling in various types of income driven repayment plans that would reduce the stress of these payments, as well as how to file a complaint with us. Um, the CFPB is one of what we, one of our roles is to monitor what's happening with the student loan servicers. And we know they are key in this return to repayment. So we really do encourage people to be in touch with us related to the challenges you are seeing or experiencing related to return to repayment. So that largely concludes the reports and just noting that related to the reports, we'll continue to monitor these trends. And one way that is really helpful for us in monitoring these trends is conversations like today. So hearing back what else is happening, what else we should be thinking about or looking for in relation to some of these things we talked about and utilizing the various tools that we have to ensure fairness and transparency in the marketplace. Um, and then just what else is happening here at the Bureau um, uh, that's not specific to the South, but likely will benefit those Southern consumers and elsewhere in the country is, that, as I just mentioned, related to medical debt, we've begun a rulemaking process to remove medical bills from Americans' credit reports. Uh, we have taken action uh, related to installment lending recently. In August, we sued a lending conglomerate known as Heights Finance that does business as things like Covington Credit, Southern Finance, Quick Credit, um, and, and, and another name for uh, essentially illegally churning loans, kind of churning borrowers to harvest, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in fees and loan costs due to that churning. Just as, you know, one example, I know I've said a lot of data already, but just one example is that in this particular lawsuit, we found that even though these loans were, you know, kind of marketed as a short-term loan, um, over a seven-year period, there were 10,000 customers who were stuck 
in uninterrupted debt during that whole time due to this kind of continual churning of loans by the lender. We are looking forward to hearing um, from consumers who may have experience with this particular lender. Um, and I'll talk about that, how to, that in a minute. Uh, there's a whole host of work we're doing related to data privacy and ownership of your own data within the financial system, as well ensure, as ensuring that this data is not being used to drive um, modern day redlining or other algorithmic bias or discriminatory practices. And then uh, again, another big initiative related to junk fees um, that has already saved hundreds of billions of dollars, households billions of dollars a year um, through reducing junk fees. And related to this actually just in the past week and including today, um, well, last week we announced a proposed rulemaking to reduce uh, overdraft fees charged by the largest banks. Um, and we can uh, share more information about that as we see people's uh, public, the public's input uh, related to that. So I'll conclude here with uh, perhaps the most important slide of the presentation, but you all may already know this, is just you know how to file a complaint with the CFPB. This is really, really important to help us understand what work we should be looking at or doing. Um, it's very simple. We can do it online or by phone. Um, and so want to make sure people have access to those resources. And um, just also feel free to be in touch with me or anyone else at the Bureau anytime. We are an open door agency and hearing feedback um, from, uh, from people, including um, in, given the important work that you all are doing, is really critical to informing how we do our work. So with that, I will stop sharing and turn it back over to Laura. So, uh, I, um, Diane, I was just reading something this morning about the um, CFPB work on the junk fees. Sure. And so one of the examples that they used was, it uh, seems like it was like if you swipe your debit card and you don't have enough money to cover that, the junk fee would be that um, insufficient funds fee that they charge. Were there were there other junk fees? And did, did that accurately describe what that entailed? Thank you, thank you, Laura, for referencing that. And um, I'll put that into the chat. Um, it is an announcement today where the CFBB, we have proposed a rule to um, prohibit insufficient fund fees on transactions that are declined uh, right at the swipe or the tap or the click of a transaction. So that is specific to insufficient fund fees and it is open for, it will be open for public comment. So we would look forward to hearing comments about that. Um, and then, but last week we issued a proposed rule uh, related to curbing overdraft fees charged by large banks. Um, and we've done work to address a whole host of other junk fees, but those are two um, from recent developments. So one of the things that was popping into my mind as we were talking about this, Diane, was the work that we do in Extension, oftentimes partnering with uh, one of the bank on coalitions or groups just to help inform consumers about some of the benefits of having a relationship with a bank and also our work in uh, recruiting local partners, banks, financial institutions to offer some of these accounts that are more accessible to low and moderate income consumers. Um, and I wondered how many of our folks who were on today, I wondered if they, uh, any of those had participated in any of that education, encouraging consumers to have a relationship with a bank or open a bank account or working with the banking partners, either one. So if you could just put that in the chat, if you're doing anything in that area, we'd be interested to know. I know that, that Megan and I have been doing some work in that area here in Arkansas. Because it does seem to be, uh, we had quite a bit higher than the, for some, on some of those indicators, I noticed that our, our state, Arkansas, had quite a bit higher um, numbers than the national averages for those. 
Uh, uh, that's correct. I think on some things like medical debt and other issues, but one place, I don't know if I mentioned it in the slide, but in the report itself, it highlights how Arkansas is actually um, doing among the best in the region in terms of reducing the unbanked rate. Um, and it's actually the only state in the eight states in which the rural unbanked rate is lower than the unbanked rate uh, for the state overall. Um, so really there's been, seems like some great work going on in Arkansas and has led to uh, those declines. I want to thank Diane for presenting the webinar, sharing that information with us. I had seen her at a, a meeting at uh, close to the end of last year and thought this would be a really interesting topic of conversation for our extension educators. We really appreciate her and all of the other great work that they do at CFPB. Thank you so much for having, having us. Um, I've learned a lot from the experiences you all have already shared in the chat. It's so important for our work. So it does sound like some follow-ups from us. So we'll share the state fact sheets with Laura, as well as um, maybe be back in touch related to resources on student loan debt, given the um, concerns that were flagged here. Uh, but please do be in touch anytime um, as, as you go about your work. And just really thanks for all that you all do every day. Thank you so much, Diane. And our next month's uh, webinar will be uh, with Portia Johnson from Alabama, and she's going to be talking about her work around educating people about completing the FAFSA, and we'll have more conversation about student loans. Thanks, everyone.